We're going to continue in our study through the book of Isaiah today, so if you'll take your Bibles and go to Isaiah chapter 30, we're going to look at chapter 30 and a little bit from chapter 31 as well. We have a, a few uh, Bibles while supplies last, so if you see an usher down your aisle, raise your hand if you need a Bible, if you didn't happen to bring one, and they'll be glad to give you one. Isaiah chapter 30 is found on page 504 in those church Bibles. I'm going to read the first five verses from chapter 30, and then the first three verses from chapter 31. So Isaiah 30, verse 1. Woe to the obstinate children. Hey, happy Father's Day. (laughs) Woe to the obstinate children, declares the Lord, to those who carry out plans that are not mine, forming an alliance, but not by my spirit, heaping sin upon sin, who go down to Egypt without consulting me, who look for help to Pharaoh's protection, to Egypt's shade for refuge. But Pharaoh's protection will be to your shame. Egypt's shade will bring you disgrace. Though they have officials in Zoan and their envoys have arrived in Hanes, everyone will be put to shame. By the way, why will everyone be put to shame? Because they've all arrived in their Hanes. You see what? (laughs) Were you following along as I? Did he just make an underwear joke? (laughs) Ignore him. All right, here we go. So though they have officials in Zoan and their envoys have arrived in Hanes, everyone will be put to shame because of a people useless. See, some of you just got it. Because of a people useless to them who bring neither help nor advantage, but only shame and disgrace. Jump over to chapter 31 and verse 1. Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. Yet he too is wise and can bring disaster. He does not take back his words. He will rise up against the house of the wicked, against those who help evildoers. But the Egyptians are men and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. When the Lord stretches out his hand, he who helps will stumble. He who is helped will fall. Both will perish together. Let's pause there and pray. Father in heaven, we thank you now as we open up our Bibles to these chapters in Isaiah, and we pray as always that you would use your word to do your good work in our hearts. May we apply these things that we read, and may we understand how relevant they are even for our day. Give us eyes to see and ears to hear, and a heart that would receive what you would have to say to us today. We're honored, Lord, that you would grace us with your presence. And where two or more are gathered, you're in our midst, so you're here today, Lord. We pray that you've been glorified through the worship, and now that you would be glorified as we study your word together. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray, and everyone said, amen. You'll notice with me in your Bibles that both chapters 30 and 31 open up in a similar way. The prophet Isaiah is pronouncing this woe upon Judah because they have sought help from Egypt. You'll notice chapter 30, verse 1, the first word is woe, and chapter 31, verse 1, the first word is woe. And we mentioned last week that when you see the word woe appearing from the lips of a prophet, uh, well, the prophet is basically warning about God's impending judgment. Now, again, Isaiah is called to prophesy to the southern kingdom of Judah. The Jewish people have divided into two camps, if you will. The northern kingdom is Israel, the southern kingdom is Judah, and the capital of the southern kingdom is Jerusalem. And Isaiah is called by God to minister to and to prophesy to the southern kingdom, and he's got a lot to say here to Jerusalem. He begins both these chapters with a word of warning to them, woe, woe to you. He even calls them obstinate children. And why is it? Well, they've made an alliance with Egypt. Now, there's nothing wrong with the nation of Egypt itself. In fact, when you look at the Bible, there are different times that God has providentially used Egypt in a wonderful way to benefit his own children. Uh, Back in Genesis, during a time of severe famine, the young budding nation of Israel, which at that time was only about 70 people, the descendants of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, in the book of Genesis, Jacob had 12 sons, and during his time, Israel experienced this terrible time of famine. Many of you know the story how one of Jacob's sons was betrayed by his other brothers, 
and Joseph was sent in slavery, ended up in Egypt, and God providentially raised up Joseph over a period of time to eventually become the prime minister of Egypt. He was second in command to Pharaoh. And it was God's providence because during the severe famine in Israel, Joseph's long lost family would end up coming down to Egypt, getting food, finding comfort, being blessed by the Egyptians primarily because of God's providential plan through Joseph. There's nothing wrong with Egypt. God has used Egypt and blessed Egypt in many ways. You see, in the New Testament, where did God tell Joseph to take Mary and the baby Jesus when Herod was trying to murder all the baby boys in Bethlehem to Egypt? Jesus would spend about the first two years of his life growing up in Egypt. You also see Egyptians ending up in the millennial kingdom. In the book of Zechariah, chapter 14, it speaks about how Egyptians will come to the house of the Lord and worship. Because God has always had a remnant of his people in every nation. And God loves the Egyptians. In fact, in the book of Isaiah, in Isaiah 19, verse 25, God says, blessed be my people, Egypt. We, despite the fact that there are presently Egypt being held hostage by the Muslim Brotherhood, there are Christians in Egypt. We even have some Coptic Christians from Egypt in our own church. The problem here in Isaiah 30 and 31 is not with Egypt. God doesn't have a problem with Egypt. God loves the Egyptians. The problem he has is that his own people, the people of Judah, have sought Egypt as a savior in the midst of a problem rather than God. That's the problem here. The people of Judah have not turned to God to get help from God in a crisis, they turn to the Egyptians. That's the problem that God has with the people of Judah. Now, let me give you the background of the story so you can appreciate what's going on here. Isaiah prophesies during the reigns of four different kings. Back in Isaiah chapter 1, verse 1, he names those four kings. The last of the four kings is Hezekiah. And Hezekiah is king during the time of chapter 30 and 31 of Isaiah. Okay, all of the book of Isaiah fits within the book of 2 Kings, because Isaiah is called by God to prophesy during the reigns of four different kings of Judah. So the king on the throne at this particular time, as we're reading Isaiah 30 and 31, is a guy by the name of Hezekiah. Now, Hezekiah is, relatively speaking, a good king. He's got some faults. Uh, everybody has, has their faults, and Hezekiah is no exception. But relatively speaking, he's a pretty good king. He becomes king when he's 25 years of age, and he reigns for 29 years. And Hezekiah ushers in great sweeping spiritual revival. He uh, breaks down all of the pagan altars that unfortunately were allowed to be there during the reign of his father, Ahaz. He smashes all the pagan idols. They had even closed up the house of God, and Hezekiah reopens it reopens the temple of God, reassigns the priests their duties. He re-implements the feasts, including particularly Passover, and he even reinstates the principle of tithing. And all of this is happening under Hezekiah's leadership. And you can read about it between 2 Kings 18 and 20. And I'm going to refer to 2 Kings 18 through 20 during the course of the teaching, because that's where these chapters from Isaiah fit. Here's one thing that King Ahaz does. In addition to all this great sweeping spiritual reformation, one of the things that 2 Kings 18 verse 7 says is this. He rebelled, that's Hezekiah, he rebelled against the king of Assyria and did not serve him. Now, the Assyrians were the major threat right now in the world. The Assyrian Empire was a formidable force they took up what is on a map today, all of Iraq, a little bit of Iran, um, some of even uh, Syria. And the Assyrians believed, based on their false understanding of their false gods, that they were supposed to dominate the world. So they're, they're coming to take Israel. And in 722 BC, the Assyrians will take the northern kingdom of Israel. But now the southern kingdom of Judah, for, for the moment they have resisted coming into, and Hezekiah, king of the southern kingdom, 
He refuses anymore to do what his father did, and that was to appease the Assyrians. Hezekiah's father, when he was king, his name was Ahaz, would give money to the Assyrians so that they wouldn't beat him up. It's kind of the idea like, you know, when a kid in elementary school gives, gives his lunch money to the bully, you know, take my lunch money so you don't beat me up. That's what Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah, was doing. He was saying to the king of Assyria, take my lunch money so you don't beat me up. And the king of Assyria was like, okay, good deal. Give me your lunch money and I won't beat you up. And so Ahaz was giving him just all this silver and gold so that you won't come and beat me up. But Hezekiah is a different man. The son of Ahaz comes to the throne now. Hezekiah, Ahaz is dead. Hezekiah comes to the throne. He's like, I'm not doing what my daddy did because I trust in the Lord my God. I'm not paying tribute to the Assyrian king. I'm trusting God to defend us. And Hezekiah was resolute in, in his convictions. I'm not, I'm not paying money to the Assyrians. I'm going to trust God to protect me. So this is the kind of guy that, that he was here. He trusted in the Lord. And just a, a quick word about the, the topic of trust. It's not really the, the theme for today, but just a quick word. Trust in God means that you do all you can and then you leave the rest to God. All right, trusting God does not mean that you check out and then expect God to just do everything. All right, well, I, I trust God for a spouse. I'm just going to sit at home and somebody will knock on my door. <laughs> That's not how it works. You have to kind of go where people are. <laughs> I'm just going to trust God for a job. I'm just going to sit at home and, and eat ham sandwiches and God's going to bring the perfect job along. How about get your resume out there, get LinkedIn or something going so that you can network and actually do your part. So when people say, I'm going to trust God, don't think that means check out. That means do all you can do, but then there's a point where you've done all you can do and now you just, you leave the rest to God. So that's the kind of guy Hezekiah was. And here's why I'm saying all this. The Assyrians now start marching down towards the southern kingdom. Hezekiah isn't sitting back saying, well, I'm just going to, well, he wouldn't eat a ham sandwich because he's kosher. I'm just going to, I'm going to have, I'm going to have a roast beef sandwich. I'm going to just check out because God's going to take care of all this. No, here's what he does. The Bible says in 2 Kings that he fortifies the city walls of Jerusalem. He makes them stronger where they are weak. And he does another brilliant thing. The fresh water source for the city of Jerusalem was on the outside of the walls. So Hezekiah takes his men and they burrow underground and they take pickaxes from two opposite directions to create a tunnel through solid bedrock under the city of David. So they can channel the spring, the Gihon spring, outside the city, underneath through the tunnel to the inside of the city. And then Hezekiah covers up the original source of the spring so that the Assyrians can't drink it and so that the Assyrians, when they come, can't cut off the fresh water supply. You cut off the fresh water supply, now you've just controlled the whole city. So Hezekiah was brilliant in this way. And in fact, today it's an engineering miracle because it's really the hand of God. How two different men with pickaxes, 1,750 feet in two different beginning points, ended up meeting underground through solid bedrock. And when we go to Israel, we actually walk through Hezekiah's tunnel, and you get an idea of just how amazing this was of what God used Hezekiah to do. So Hezekiah trusts God, but he's like, I'm going to fortify my cities, and I'm going to bring the fresh water supply in, and then we're going to wait. Now, meanwhile, the Assyrians are marching further, further down. And the Bible says they start taking every fortified city in Judah, not Jerusalem yet, but every other smaller fortified city. And when Hezekiah sees this and sees them coming now to Jerusalem and they're encircling now Jerusalem, he buckles, he caves. You know, he was a man of good intentions. I'm gonna trust God, I'm gonna rely on God, but how many of you understand that good intentions are meaningless if not followed through with good actions? Good intentions are meaningless without good actions. Hezekiah caves. He gets afraid. Look, I, I'm, I'm not faulting the guy. I think many of us would probably do the same thing. But what ends up happening is he sends an envoy to Egypt, sends him with some money. 
Let's go down there quick and you get the Egyptians to come fight for us. Didn't pray to God. Didn't ask God for help. Didn't seek the Lord. He ran to the Egyptians. Now you get the background of this story. Isaiah comes in here to chapter 30 and 31 and he says, woe to you. You're, you're, you're relying on Pharaoh. You think Pharaoh's better than God? You think Pharaoh's going to get you out of this mess? This is what Isaiah is saying to them. You're trusting in Pharaoh and chariots and horses instead of the Lord your God. Woe to you. Woe to you. You know what happens? The Egyptians come and they get slaughtered by the Assyrians. You want to know why? Because God will take out from underneath us every false thing that we rely on until we finally get to the place where we trust Him. God wants to have His rightful place in our lives. We end up scurrying around like Hezekiah and the people of Judah did, trying to rely on everything else and everyone else that we can often instead of turning to God. We need to be people who rely on God, who pray to God, who see Him as He's my deliverer. He's my strength. He's my rock. He's my fortress. He's my ever-present help in times of trouble. Instead, what Hezekiah did in the people of Judah, we're going to run to Egypt. The Egyptians will help us. No, the Egyptians aren't going to help you. In fact, this is why Isaiah refers to the Egyptians in chapter 30, verse 7, as utterly useless. In chapter 30, verse 7, he calls them Rahab the do-nothings. Isn't that great? He's just like, he's like, the Egyptians are just, they're just do-nothings. Not, not to disparage the Egyptians, but to say to the people of Judah, you're relying on a source that can't save you. You're looking for help in the wrong places. And so this is why Isaiah, again, look at chapter 31, verse 1. This is why Isaiah in 31, 1 says to them, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help, who rely on horses, who trust in the multitude of their chariots and in the great strength of their horsemen, but do not look to the Holy One of Israel or seek help from the Lord. But unfortunately, the people didn't want to hear it. Like, we, we don't want to hear Isaiah. We don't want to hear this. We don't want to hear it. Look, look at chapter 30. Go back to chapter 30, verses 10 and 11. Chapter 30, verse 10. They say to the seers, see no more visions. And to the prophets, give us no more visions of what is right. Tell us pleasant things. Prophesy illusions. Leave this way. Get off this path and stop confronting us with the Holy One of Israel. Do you see what they're saying? They're like, we, Isaiah, stop this. La, 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 la. We don't, we, we don't want to hear what you have to say from God. You know, and, they, and the people of Judah start singing Fleetwood Mac. They're like, tell us lies. Tell us sweet little lies. <laughs> you know, but we don't, we don't want to hear the truth. We don't want to hear that, that God's upset with us, that God's our... We, we're, don't you see all these Assyrians around us? We got to do something. And we've, we've turned to the Egyptians. So stop, stop with all your prophecy and just let us be. And God says through Isaiah in verse 15, he says this, chapter 30, verse 15, this is what the sovereign Lord says. The Holy One of Israel says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. Underline that in your Bibles. In repentance and rest, this is verse 15, in repentance and rest is your salvation. In quietness and trust is your strength. God says to them through the prophet Isaiah, if you would just sit still, you would see the mighty hand of God. In repentance, if you would just turn from the path you're on and turn towards me, that's what repentance is. In repentance and in rest, you'll be saved. You'll be helped. In quietness and trust is your strength. Just be quiet and be still and wait on me. If you would just sit still and wait on me and trust me, I'm going to take care of you. But the rest of verse 15 says, but you would have none of it. God says, if you'll just wait on me, trust me, have confidence in me, it's going to be okay but you would have none of it. You would have none of it. 
They wanted to do it their way. They didn't want to wait for God. They said, we got this, God. And you know what is so wonderful and amazing about our Father in heaven? Is that they didn't want to wait for him. So you know what God said to them? Then I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. And eventually you'll get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And eventually you will have exhausted all your resources. You will have tried everything. And eventually you'll turn to me. And when you do, I'll be there. I'll be waiting for you. That's the loving heart of our Father. Well, the plan with the Egyptians failed. So Hezekiah resorted to something else. He did something that he vowed he would never do. He repeated the sins of his father. And he gave the bully his lunch money. In 2 Kings, it tells us that Hezekiah then paid the king of Assyria to go away. And I'll translate the equivalency of Scripture when it talks about the measurement of what he gave. Here's what he gave. 11 tons of silver and one ton of gold. The market value today would be between 35 and 40 million dollars. And you know what's even more tragic? The Bible says in 2 Kings that Hezekiah, in order to pay the one ton of gold, stripped the gold off of the temple of God and gave it to the Assyrian king. He stole from God and God's house to pay off the king of Assyria. And you know what? That still didn't work. He gave him 35 to 40 million dollars in silver and gold. And you know what the Bible says? That the field officer of the Assyrians comes to the wall of Jerusalem in the hearing of all the people of Judah in the city of Jerusalem, and he taunts them. And he ridicules God, insults God, intimidates the people, and insults Hezekiah. And Hezekiah hears this and all the people with him and they become afraid and they're like, I thought you paid this guy off. He goes, yeah, I, I did. I paid him off. And, and they're still threatening to come against us. And they're insulting God now. And now, now it's an affront to God and all of this. And, and Hezekiah's getting all worked up. He's like, I've tried this all. I, I tried. I, I got the Egyptians. That failed. I've, I've paid him all this money. I stripped the gold off the temple of God. And that still hasn't worked. I'm undone and I don't know what else to do. And you know what else he did when you don't know what else to do? You go to God. And so finally Hezekiah prays because he feels the shame and the disgrace. And he prays to God and he sends his officials to the prophet Isaiah. Get counsel from the prophet Isaiah. I'm ready to hear what he has to say. And Lord, would you please deliver us? I got no one else to turn to except you. And God had been waiting. God had been waiting. Now, you know what happens when we get to the bottom of ourselves? Sometimes friends, and maybe, maybe they're not really friends, sometimes our friends, when we get to the bottom of ourselves, will say things like, I told you so. You should have listened to me. I tried to warn you, bro. tried to warn you, sis. And you decided to go down that path. And now look at your life. And, you know, with friends like that, who really needs friends, right? But let me tell you how God responds when we get to the bottom of ourselves. This is an important verse, so I like with your Bibles open to go to verse 18 of chapter 30. This is God's response. Notice. Chapter 30, verse 18. Yet the Lord longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. For the Lord is a God of justice. Blessed are all who wait for him. Isn't that a great verse? When we get to the bottom of ourselves and we've exhausted every other thing, trying to do life ourselves and trying to fix life ourselves, finally we, we get to the end of the road and we turn to God. He doesn't shame us. He doesn't say, I told you so. He just says, I've been waiting for you. Three things from this verse. God longs to be gracious to you. God rises to show you compassion. And God blesses those who wait for him. Understand the character of God, friends, because sometimes, you know, God doesn't need a PR agent, but sometimes I think he's got a, a, gotten a bad rap. 
Because people's view of God becomes so skewed that they don't understand the compassion and grace of our Father in heaven. But the Bible is replete with examples and verses. Nehemiah would say in Nehemiah 9.17, but you are a forgiving God, gracious and compassionate, slow to anger and abounding in love. David would say in Psalm 86.15, but you, O Lord, are a compassionate and gracious God, slow to anger, abounding in love and faithfulness. Joel would say in Joel 2.13, return to the Lord your God, for he is gracious and compassionate. God longs to be gracious to you. Keep reading the verses, though, verse 19 to 21. Verse 19, O people of Zion who live in Jerusalem, you will weep no more. How gracious he will be, that's God, when you cry for help. As soon as he hears, he will answer you. Although the Lord gives you the bread of adversity and the water of affliction, your teachers will be hidden no more. With your own eyes, you will see them. And whether you turn to the right or to the left, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. I want you to underline verse 21. I'm gonna put it on the screens for you because for the first time, the Lord showed me something about this verse I'd never seen before. I've read this passage many, many times. And for the first time, something really jumped out at me. You know, I used to think it was just an inconsequential statement, but but I started to wonder, why is it that God is speaking from behind them? Why does he say to them, you're you're gonna hear, your ears will hear a voice behind you saying, this is the way, walk in it. Now, obviously it means that God wants to give them guidance and direction. This is the way, walk in it. If you turn to the left or turn to the right, God's gonna be right there behind you saying, okay, make this turn, make that turn because he loves us and he wants to guide us and direct us. But why from behind? Why isn't God out front leading the way? And then as I read this and prayed over it, here's, here's what I realized. They're hearing God from behind because they had turned their backs on Him. And when you turn your back on someone and they try to talk to you, you hear it from behind. Some of you are hearing God from behind because you've turned your back on Him. But I want you to know that He longs to be gracious to you. There's a longing in the heart of God to be gracious to you and merciful and forgiving because he's a loving father. He longs to be gracious to you. He rises to show you compassion. Now I know the Bible says that God neither slumbers nor sleeps, but it's figuratively. It's as if it's saying, God can't wait to get up in the morning to find you so he can show you compassion. And blessed are all who wait for him. And God says, and even if you don't wait for me, I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. Because I long to be gracious to you and I rise to show compassion on you. I want to bless you if you wait on me, but even if you don't, I'll wait for you. I'll wait for you. And when you finally get to the end of yourself, I'll be there. That's what God is saying to some of you. You've been running from God for too long. You've tried things yourself. And how well did that go? You've tried to fix things. You've relied on other things and other people without turning to God. He's been the last on your list until finally you get to the place where you realize you have nowhere to turn but up. And God's there waiting. Here's what happens. Hezekiah prays to God. He gets to one of those bottom of the barrel experiences. Prays to God. 2 Kings 19 says that God shows up in a big way. And God takes out 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. Overnight. The people of Jerusalem wake up the next morning and all they see is a sea of dead bodies around the city. And then the Bible says that Sennacherib, the king of the Assyrians, withdraws when he had lost basically his whole army, and he goes back to Nineveh, the capital city of Assyria, where his two sons assassinate him. God takes care of our problems. 
in a big way. Why do we waste so much time trying to do it ourselves? How about we turn to him? Some of you are tired. You're tired of running. You're tired of trying to do things on your own. You're exhausted. And God is saying to you, I'm waiting. And when you turn to me, you will find me when you seek me with all of your heart. Isn't it time to give it to God? Isn't it time to give yourself to God? Let's learn from Isaiah 30 and 31. God longs to be gracious. He rises to show you compassion. Blessed are all who wait for him. Amen. Let's pray together. Father, as we come to the end of today's Bible study, we just thank you for the example that you have given to us that despite Judah's sin, despite the way that they tried to do everything without you, you waited for them because you love us. You waited until they had exhausted their own resources. You waited until they had tried everything and were finally at the end of their rope and they turned to you. And you had been there the whole time just waiting. Thank you that you wait for us, Lord. I pray right now for those who are in a similar place. They've heard this Bible study and they would say it pretty much describes their life. They've tried to do things their own way. They've tried to fix things themselves. They've tried to look at every other resource except you. And now it's time to surrender. So Lord, I pray for them that right now before they leave this place, they will do just that. They will surrender whatever the issue is. They will surrender their lives to you and they will yield to you because you long to be gracious and you rise to show us compassion and you bless those who wait for you. So Lord, I pray right now that you would express your grace to those who need it, that you would rise to show compassion to those who need it, that you would bless them who would respond right now to this Bible study and draw near to you. I'm gonna pause in my prayer right now with your head still bowed, your eyes still closed, and I'm just gonna ask you first, this is the salvation question. You've not yielded your life to Christ. You've not given your life to Christ, and you realize that today you need to surrender to him. You're tired of living life on your own. You're tired of trying to do things your way, and now you wanna surrender your life to Jesus. If that's you, I want you to slip up your hand. Just raise your hand where you are. Say, that's, that's me, Pastor Gary. Yes, God bless you, I see you. Just say, just keep up your hand up high so I can pray for you. Yes, God bless you. Anyone else? Yes, down front. You've lived your life your own way long enough. Today's the day for you to get right with Jesus. I'm going to first pray for you. I'm going to invite you to pray this prayer with me right where you're seated. Just say, Lord Jesus, I'm tired of living my life apart from you. Come into my life right now, Jesus. I surrender to you. Forgive me of my sins. Be Lord of my life. Come into my heart. Save me today. By faith I receive you. And now I'm going to ask those of you who already know Christ, but you've been holding on to something yourself. You haven't surrendered it to the Lord. You've tried to fix it your own way. You've tried to do life your own way without him. And today can be the day that you just, you're going to surrender that thing to him. You're just going to say, Lord, just, I just want you to be Lord of every aspect of my life. So now if that's you, I want you to raise your hand. Just raise it up high. God sees it. I'm looking around. God sees it. Lord, you see the hands that are raised and you know the hearts. For most of us, there are times we try to do life ourselves our own way. 
And so, Lord, you know right now that those who have raised their hands are saying, I'm tired of doing things my way. I want you, Lord, to take care of this matter. I want you, Lord, to resolve this situation. So I'm just going to sit still and trust you. I've done all I can do. So now, Lord, I just look to you to do the rest. In repentance and rest is my salvation, and quietness and trust is my strength. So I'm going to trust you, Lord. I'm just going to be still before you, and I'm going to wait on you. I'm going to trust you. I'm going to release it to you now, Lord. I'm going to watch your mighty hand at work in ways I just simply cannot do. So, Lord, this is our prayer together. We just thank you for your grace and your love in our lives. We thank you that this describes you, Lord. You long to be gracious to us. There's a longing in your heart to be gracious to us. You rise to show us compassion. You bless us when we wait for you. And even when we don't, you wait for us, Lord. You're a good God. And we thank you for loving us and dying for us. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And all God's people said, amen. Amen. God bless you all.